Hello, everybody. This is the Chini Maji podcast by Impact Africa Network um, on our weekly podcast. Excited to have another, uh, what I would call, died in the wall uh, uh, eco- ecosystem actor here, uh, Kennedy Kirui of Tanasuk Africa. Yes, right? yes. CEO and co founder of Tanasuk Africa, which is a design agency or company. Well, how do you guys define yourselves? Uh, so, basically, we are a design thinking and software consulting company. And we mostly work with uh, startups, corporates, and NGOs who are looking to build products for African markets. And the idea behind it for us is we're able to combine a lot of the design thinking processes and rapid software development and testing to help people quickly validate what they are trying to do, grow it, and now like make it something a bit more stable and Money making. Money making. Yeah. Very important. Yes, right. it's very important. So across that customer base, uh, you said startups, NGOs, and and which other and sector? And corporates. And corporates. Mm. Um, obviously, we are more targeted towards the start. Our audience is made basically startup, the startup ecosystem mm-hmm. uh, and emerging entrepreneurs. So obviously, we are keen to understand, you know, from you. Uh, how design overlaps with the startup world and what are some of the misconceptions? Just maybe define what, how you see design um, intersecting with the startup world, what are some of the misconceptions uh, entrepreneurs make or what are some of the best practices uh, from, your, from that point of view? Okay, I think to do that I'll have to give a bit of a slight background. Mm-hmm. Uh, so between 2013 and 2016 I used to run the iHub consulting unit so it, it was made up of a research arm, a UX lab, a software engineering team. And uh, over time, based on our work with different entities, we realized the assumption that we had originally made that our customers knew the product they wanted or understood the problem they were looking to solve was actually false. So we really had to figure out a way through which we help them validate those assumptions in terms of what they are thinking the problem is Is it something that they just came up with in a boardroom and thought it was a really good idea but there's no market for it? You're actually not solving any problem or is it that you're solving a symptom? So that's where the design element came in. Design being a problem solving approach as opposed to the traditional sense we think a lot about it as the look, the visual look like that's what many people think design is. Uh, but I'm talking a bit more about design as a problem-solving approach, mm-hmm. uh, a process through which, it, one, it's repeatable and it helps you really understand if you're solving a problem. Mm-hmm. So the first part of it is um, designing the right thing by understanding what what challenges your target users are facing, uh, what aspirations do they have? Like, is it something that they would really like to change or is it something that they've accepted? So it's almost product market fit. That's, yes. It's a search yes. for product market fit. Yes, yes, yes. So the first part is, as I mentioned, designing the right thing. Mm. The second part is designing it right. Mm. Because at times, and this is something you'll see a lot in the corporate sector, uh, they'll identify a real problem that people face, but the final product that they push out to, to the market might not solve that problem in a way that will like attract people and get people using it yes so it's it's not something that i would say just the corporate sector faces it's even magnified in the startup ecosystem because one you have mostly for african founders you have i think one shot to get it right (laughs) african founders you got one shot to get it right. yeah because (laughs) if you run out of money that's it so yeah so it's really important one to be able to do it quickly and to improve the chances of it working or it being adopted to really put the users at the center of it so uh our work with startups is more to do with really trying to get them to put their customers or their users at the center of everything that they do. Mm. Uh, it doesn't mean you're ignoring your business goals in terms of revenue and that type of a thing. The idea is to figure out a problem there in the market, come up with solutions, and then see how those solutions can actually generate revenue or 
like grow your startup. So working it backwards instead of the top down, we are now looking at it more from a bottom down, bottom up approach than top down. Working from the customer backwards. So yes, say. yes, and then now mapping other things into it, looking at your different stakeholders. So for example, some of the work that we've done had very many different components. So you have the customers who are buying something online. You also have to think about your delivery partners. You have to think about your merchants. But it's you start with the customer first and then now see how the other things fit in. Right. Yeah. And and this relates a lot to some of the, you know, challenges that you see or misconceptions that, that I, I have seen quite a bit in our ecosystem. And you see people actually building an app, right? And uh, saying, hey, I'm, I've got this app that's going to solve this problem, right? And we recently hosted Scott Chacon, who was founder of, of GitHub here uh, for an ecosystem talk. And he had this analogy about talking about like people chase the latest, greatest technology. So he had this, he was talking about um, blockchain for dogs, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's this mentality that, you know, technology was, you know, I have this idea and I'll just put it out there and somehow it should work. So what do what you have to say about how widespread is that as a problem in our ecosystem? The assumption that technology will just be adopted and work and solve the problem. Okay, there are two parts to it. One, if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. So if you look at most of our founders, especially in the tech ecosystem, they tend to have a technical background. Right. So anything that they see, they'll try to solve using technology. Right. So that's the first big part. And I think it takes a bit of time and like a lot of unlearning for you to change your mindset and start looking at problems first and then looking at technology as a tool or a mechanism to solve a problem. Because it's even interesting on our day-to-day -day work, uh, we at times have to advise our clients that this is not something that you can solve using technology. So one of the projects we did a couple of years ago, back in 2016, mm -hmm. uh, our final recommendation was more to do with the entity rethinking their customer service and customer experience mm -hmm. and focusing less on investing in expensive technology and in trends and that type of a thing. So it's it's more of like if you're used to doing things in a certain way, it takes a certain level of unlearning to actually change and look at it from I'm trying to solve a problem. Let me first understand the problem, uh, the context in which it occurs. The stakeholders. Uh, yeah, the stakeholders, the competitive processes, landscape, yeah. uh, even small things like is it a big enough problem to solve mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. So it takes quite a bit of time to unlearn that. The second part on trends, it's I think it's more to do with now incentives. I mean, I'm lazy, you're lazy. If we see free I'm money, you're easy money. <laughs> <laughs> so you claim. <laughs> so the thing is, if you look at even how... One, from a recognition perspective, if you want to build your brand, it's mostly on the newer technologies, the more exciting things. It's mm -hmm. even easy to raise money for those types of things. So you will easily find people gravitating towards that type of a thing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. jumping from one to the other. So I've got blockchain end. with AI, with you know VR. Yes, exactly. On a slide deck somewhere, so fund this thing. Yeah, there's. I don't remember the exact number, but there was a study about European AI startups, and forty-seven percent of them didn't have any AI. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they but, had it on a slide. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where the AI was <laughs> on the slide. <laughs> but if you look at the actual solution, there's nothing to it. It can work to your benefit in certain situations, whereby you're able to actually get a bit of traction, raise a bit of money, but, then try but, and build but, but, but that, 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 that suggests that you're raising from uh, unsophisticated investors, right? Because yes. if you don't have actual... You know, one of the things, this mm. is such an important thing. Mm. Every single time I hear somebody saying, I'm mm. doing a, a blockchain this, mm. or I'm doing an AI this, my first question is always, is that technology fundamentally necessary to solve the problem? Or could you solve it without blockchain? Right? Or even without tech. Or even without tech, yeah. for that matter, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the thing is, yeah, definitely it's mostly from 
grand type of money or competitions, that's where you'll get that type of money. But but in Europe, it's not grand all the time. So there's yeah. this other element also, which is just the sexy thing that yes, everybody's yes. talking about. Yeah, and the, even investors have that thing of wanting to ban, uh, to jump on the bandwagon. Not a bandwagon. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and then you don't want to miss out on like the next the next big thing. thing. <laughs> yeah, because you're doing your due Form diligence. Is, is real, are <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> you know, this is so true because one of the things, so I mean, <clears throat> I, I spent my career in the Bay Area, right? And when you go there for the first time, you assume that people know uh, people know the right way to do things, mm -hmm. or they 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 know because you're young, you're you're impressionable. So you you just think that people don't have things where they just follow trends, or there's this formal thing that affects grown-ups. Mm -hmm. That you should you should think they should be rational, pragmatic, dig deep into the conversation, and, and be real. What I learned after maybe eight years of seeing this new trend, cloud mm. comes in and everybody has a cloud for it this. It took me a while. It took me a while. <laughs> because listen, these are the smartest people in the world, you assume, right? Yeah. Only to realize when I broke the books, when I realized that these fools, they're, most of these people, they're just following trends. That's when I was like, ah, whenever somebody says I'm doing AI for this, mm. you need to dig deep to the problem. What problem are you solving? Which yeah. is kind of what you're saying, design thinking, mm. working from the custom mm -hmm. backwards yeah. from the problem backwards. Yes. Yeah, that's that's very true. And it's I think it's more to do with its human nature than anything else. Mm. But to the earlier conversation of if you give me a hard way to do something and an easy way to do something, uh, if the consequences for doing it the easy way same, same the same thing with how people steal. Like if you see government officials, if there are no consequences and the profit is clear right from the beginning, mm -hmm. I'll tend to always go for the easy way out. And the other part is building real products is really, really boring. So this is what I usually tell my team a lot. We are not in the sexy industry. Uh, so if you think of the gold rush, there are people who made money from prospecting for gold, mm -hmm. but there are people who made money from selling shovels right. and pickaxes. Right. That it wasn't the sexy did. thing. It wasn't the sexy thing. And right. unfortunately, a lot of impactful and meaningful things happen you when know. you're not doing the sexy thing. The day-to-day -day grind of really trying to figure out how to make this work. Really working on like boring and repetitive things which over time compound and add up, yeah, but it's not the most interesting thing to do. You know what, I, what people I, 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 I will actually, in a sense, beg to differ around that. My, mm. my, pers my personal perception, mm. I find solving real problems mm. very, very sexy and exciting. Yeah, but they are hard. Hard is okay. <laughs> so here's the thing. It, it, the mm. way I look at it is like, why would, it's a question of where you spend your time, right? Like, okay. uh, for me, uh, the, the way I look at the world is... Um, Something that is hard, well, something that is hard is also presents an opportunity that most people are not going to pursue. So if you can actually be successful in solving it, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a natural moat, right, yes. around that mm -hmm. around that problem. But let's let's kind of move on to, with with that said, you know, the state of the ecosystem. You've been here, you know, since Kitambo. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen this place evolve and, and mature. Where would you say we are right now? If you're just to kind of maybe try and define to your best of your ability where we are in the ecosystem in terms of maturation? Okay, we've definitely come a long way. I think my first real, like, real interaction with the ecosystem was I think back in 2008 or 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when, when I had uh, just started out and it was the place to go. Like, right. There were so many good events and so many people that you could connect with. And I remember at that time, you could meet almost all these like big founders at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Like you could interact easily with the likes of Liko from Pesapal. Uh, I don't remember meeting Waiboshi from Virtual City, but almost everyone that you can think about in the ecosystem. Yeah, we had Kane point. here last week and yeah. said, said the same thing. Right? Yes. It was the meeting point, yeah. the networks were built there. Yes, yes, yes. So the thing is that when you kind of connect, that's how I got an internship at Pesapal and then ended up working with them after I completed uni and then my journey now into technology kind of picked up from them. Mm -hmm. So I would really say like the ecosystem has grown. It's, def it's definitely moved beyond the hubs. Mm -hmm. So I think in the beginning a lot of the spotlight was on what's going on within the hubs and the startups coming out of it. There are very many good ones at this point in time, case and point, and as education. Uh, they, they were part of the M Lab 
pivoting competition. Same thing with uh, Sandy. Uh, a lot of the people that used to hang around that place, the likes of Kane, have gone on to be CTOs at Twigger. The likes of uh, uh, is not as known. It's called James Mwai. Is like so. A lot of the people that you used to see in that space, they are doing something really meaningful at this point in right, time. Right, right. Which uh, is great. Which is actually uh, for me, it is so encouraging because that is the natural process yes. of evolution that you should be you should be moving towards. Right. The capacity is growing. Yes. Yes. So uh, and. The other way to look at it in terms of measuring growth is uh, how established certain careers are, are now. Right. So because a lot of the startups that were really young, let's say five years ago or seven to ten years ago, have gotten market traction and are looking to grow their teams, we see, we're seeing a higher scarcity of talent, especially senior, senior engineering and design talent. Yeah, yeah. 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 So like... You, you see a lot of like placement startups coming up, the likes of Fuzu, the likes of Brave. It's, it's a very good indicator of how the well, space is are, growing. Right. Yeah, and now and then you have new entrants like Andela, who also like have now taken to the, to the next level in terms of um, talent was right. in the sense now that... Leveling up the talent. Not really from that side. Mm -hmm. Before they level up the talent, they need to get talent to help them level up the talent. I but now the question is, it was still a relatively smaller ecosystem, so mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's this huge demand for talent. Where do you get it? Right. Yeah. Right. So, the other part of it is more of now like the non-traditional tech careers like product management, design thinking, you actually see a lot of demand for that type of a thing. Yeah, so the ecosystem has definitely grown. Mm. Uh, we're seeing more and more companies who have significant traction, uh, people moving outside Kenya in terms of uh, the areas that they serve their customers, mm. uh, teams growing from a team made up of five scrappy individuals to like 30 plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's been a great Mm -hmm. improvement in that sense. That, that's interesting. So at the same time we hear about the challenges of raising uh, money and growth money, right? Um, and, you know, there's this whole conversation uh, that, you know, as local founders, like you said in the beginning, uh, they have significant challenges around cash flow, right? And cash flow is really all about, you know, how much runway do you have and can you actually raise money for your next uh, stage? Talk a little bit about, about that, and let's see if we can unpack that a little bit to help people understand why, mm. why at the same time things are growing, who's growing, how are they growing, you know, while a lot of people are not able to raise growth capital. It's, it's a very, very complex problem in the sense that there are two clear parts like most startups have used in our market. They are the more traditional types of startups. So think of even a big company now like Sediland. They only closed like the first big round the other day. But before that, these were the startups that would use revenue, customer revenue to continuously grow and improve. And, but of course, it gets to a point if you want to now like really jump to the next level, you have to get a bit of funding. For them, it hasn't been, too, it hasn't been that difficult. It's not easy either because they have traction, they have a track record, they've been in operation for like the last 15 years. But the deeper story there is that the founder of you know, Ken, had went, they went through some hard times. Yeah, that, that, that will always happen. <laughs> always I, I, I don't think anyone finds that part easy, no matter which part of the world you come from. But now you compound with the fact that uh, from just a network perspective, as an indigenous founder, an African founder, I have a smaller network of people with money compared to to now someone who's gone, exposed. Yeah, who's exposed and a bit more visible and a bit more in like basically in a wealthier nation. So think of it this way. Mm. If I wanted to start a company tomorrow and I was looking for seed money, to be honest, if I'm looking for let's say three hundred thousand dollars I don't know who can give me that you're money. You're not going to get it. Yeah, like you, my family won't give me that money. Right. Uh, my friends won't give me that money. I can't get the money from a local like 
debt capital or that, that type of a thing. So it, it significantly makes it harder in the long run and it applies in a, every stage. So it's just a sum of your network. Right. And then the second part to it is now more of a, the perception element because especially with the international news headlines, you will see a lot of news about expert founders raising. Mm. So without knowing, and okay, there's no scientific evidence to it at this point in time, it kind of skews the dynamics. In but the Bill and Melinda Gates did that study, which kind of, they put a number to it. Right? Oh, okay. Right? They put oh. that number in 2017 and mm. said, I think it was something close to 85 to 90% of the fintech funded startups were, mm. were expert founded mm. led startups. Yeah. So they put a scientific, they put a number to it. Now, in I was talking, I was talking about the perception element okay. whereby if a certain group keeps fundraising and like getting this amount of money, uh, when you're going to pitch as a black founder or an African black founder, uh, one, we've talked about the networks and money being tribal, I'm more, I'm more likely to invest in someone who's like me. Exactly, yeah. Because I yeah. kind of know them. That pattern part. recognition. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's the biggest issue with that. Space. So, 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 and this is this is not unique to, to our ecosystem. I mean, Silicon Valley right now is going through this whole reckoning mm. with the lack of diversity, right? I mm. mean, <clears throat> I spent quite a bit of time there and many, many companies, almost all the companies I worked at, mm. uh, majority of them, I was the only black person. Oh. Okay. And I was the only African person, obviously, <laughs> right? <'Cause, laughs> But then, so, I mean, it, it, is, it was such a real thing. You go into a, a, a and, and, and so Silicon Valley has had to deal with this kind of like, a, um, you know, male, white male uh, dominated yeah. environment. And yep. as you can see, it has, it has had some very negative effects for- Even on the products. Right, even on the, even the, even the things that are created. Because yeah. who's funded, who, mm. whatever is funded is what's built. Yeah, even the team building, it has their biases and all that. Right. Thing. So it's, it's, it's a global problem that uh, the interesting thing for me, um, I kind of, in a sense, when you, you see, in life you need to see proof points to tell you that something is possible. Yes. So whenever I looked at the, the, the hierarchy in Silicon Valley, I did not see any black person. So I always, in my sense, even though I was very ambitious and self-confident. Yeah, you kind of have a ceiling without You knowing. have a ceiling in the back of your mentally, mind. Mentally, yeah, mentally right? you have a ceiling. And that's why it maybe took me a long time to realize that, wait, these people are just following trends. <laughs> oh, they're, they're not sharper than me. They're not sharper than me. And so anyway, when I looked over the fence into our ecosystem and I started doing my research to decide whether I would come back and actually be part of uh, changing the African narrative, I was stunned and shocked to see at, to see like you're talking about the headlines and who's yep. getting funded and what was happening. To me, it was such a deep, it's such a deep, uh, it's such a personal thing, right? Because it's affected my career very directly, right? Yeah. In terms of then, then you thought you were running away from that problem. Right. I thought I was. I thought only to find that holy cow, this is. This is even real in our own market. And so mm. it would shock anybody in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, to understand that, oh my God, the problem that we have there mm. is the same problem that we have here in Africa. It's pretty, yes. it's pretty amazing. Um, anyway, so I guess what do you think would be some of the potential solutions to this? I mean, what can, what, what can be done or what can a founder do? How, how can we approach this as an ecosystem or as individuals? I think you've talked... Like you mentioned something that's quite significant, uh, the fact that even within the valley you couldn't see people like you in senior positions. I think the more we have stories about black founders doing something impactful, and not just locally, you see it, it perpetuates a certain way of thinking. Perception. Where, yeah, yeah, perception whereby to you the only successful people look like this and right. you don't look like that. So right. that would be a really good step to to start with, we need more stories of like African black founders doing a lot of impactful things. They are there, like the, those founders are there. They just the interesting to... thing is this: mm -hmm. I have tried to get some founders who are doing things, not even the most successful ones, the ones who've got some traction, mm -hmm. to come and talk on the podcast. The reason we have a podcast mm -hmm. is to democratize and demystify the startup building process, a process, okay, and and, and 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 get the knowledge out there so that people can say, hey. Let me not make that mistake. Oh, wait a minute. If he's done it, I can do it. That's yeah, exactly. But a lot of them don't want to come out and, and talk. 
No, what's the what's the reason? I'm gonna ask you that question. <laughs> you, what do you think the reason is? You've been here longer than I have, and I'm shocked. Like, why do they want to not? Okay, I think uh, a big part of it is also more to do with, uh, and you'll notice that as I mentioned earlier, it's a lot of technical founders, or like people who are, who are in a technical environment. There are very few like marketing type of founders who understand mm-hmm. the value of. PR and communication, so I think they'll be like, you're just wasting my time. Like, it doesn't add any value to me at this point in time. Mm -hmm. It's taking me away from my work, basically. Like, I I could actually be doing work, but I'm talking to you. No, I don't, I I think there's something even more more insidious Mm. than that. Mm. I think, from when I've talked to them, because I obviously talk to them and say, hey, what's what's the issue? There's a certain kind of, almost like I would say, Mm. um, it's, I don't know if it's a fear, Right, because we come from a, you know, people have lost businesses because some powerful person has come and appropriated the situation. Historically, back in the but it's really hard to do that in tech. Exactly. Yeah, right? like but so, so here's the thing: I've, I've talked to people and they say, ah, you know what? I just want to stay cheap. It's not about they have time. We hang out. We we talk. We, it's not the time thing. Mm-hmm. At least the ones I've talked to. It's something else, and I'm trying to understand what that is. Because if we cannot get people to tell stories... Yeah, and then how do we inspire the next generation of founders to reach for this guy? Exactly. Yeah, like, exactly. It's a big problem that I face personally. And that's why I'm so thankful for guys like you and mm-hmm. Kane and, and, and Timba and all these folks who are like, yeah, let's, let's take control of the narrative and start to change perceptions. It's bigger than people understand. I think another part to it, and it's more to do with the history of how the hubs and people have generally been more visible have acted or perceived to have acted, Mm -hmm. there's this general perception that if I'm running something around startups and entrepreneurs, I'll do, like, I'll use you to my own gain only. Interesting. Yeah, so, like, I'll talk about the startups or the founders in my space so that I can convince World Bank to give me money to do something. Uh. Yeah, so there's, that is a big part, and there's uh, quite a bit of acrimony within the, like, it's not a unified ecosystem. I mean, unified. you don't expect it to be a unified ecosystem. Why but there's that perception. It's human beings, boss. No, you should Human be, beings always quarrel and that's, fight. That's, that's They're not, never really on the same side. That's not necessarily always true. Because if you look at different ecosystems, I think mm. it's very cultural. Mm. If you look at, for example, the Bay Area, right? I mean, there is a certain, what I learned in the Bay Area was that you, you are helpful, you are available. That is what has made that place... To me, that was what it's meant to be in the tech startup world. Helpful, mm. available, supportive, free with information. So, to me, this mm. was the culture I associated with technology, with the whole yeah. tech startup ecosystem, the ethos. That's where I grew up as a professional. Only to come here mm. and find that it only, it only dawned on me very recently mm. that even the people who are built technology startups here, I thought, they would, I thought this was a global thing. It is not. Yeah, so uh, the question then I would pose to you is uh, in an environment that has scarcity issues. Scarcity is Yeah, thing. how that play out. You see, then it's, it's, it's interesting because if you look at the same time mm. at the Tel Aviv ecosystem, right? Mm. And they have this cultural underpinning mm. of the Jewish kind yeah. of, right? Mm. And they still have the same kind of like supportive, you know, and maybe it's, it, it has to do with culture. And scarcity contributes to culture, mm. right? And how do we overcome this then, right? I think it's just a factor of time. <laughs> it's not one of those things that you can fix overnight. Right, I, I agree with you. The more people realize the value in helping each other out and supporting each other out, creating larger markets instead of trying to like take a big share of like a small, small cake. Point, yeah. yeah, look at this uh, safari from Kenya's biggest telco had the same issue in the beginning, whereby there are bits they were not so open to the idea of allowing third artists to use and pay mm-hmm. They really tried to take on the product development internally mm-hmm. instead of allowing people to do it. But once they started doing a bit more of that, they quickly realized that, oh, actually, a lot of the innovative things that can grow our market and our revenue is out there. Exactly. If I allow people to partner and collaborate with me, I'll definitely grow. Now that you brought up Safari, do you think that change has fully manifested across the whole organization? Because you still hear things. Um... No, of course <laughs> not. Of course not. Of course. 
uh, one of the biggest, one of the hardest things to do in this world is uh, change the culture of the organization, even a small one. So uh, part of the reason I started what I'm doing now, so mm. a bit of history to how I got to running a design thinking company. Mm. Uh, I used to run the I have consulting team for mm. about three to four years. Uh, I left and joined a startup to really try and help them grow their product and also really change the organizational culture and really prime it for now expansion and growth. Mm. Uh, but along the line, when you're trying to change culture, you will rub people off the wrong way, you will come across egos, and if you really don't have the support and like the right environment to make the changes, you're the one who will leave. Right. So that's how I actually left. Okay. Like it was just a matter of cultural clashes and that type of thing. Mm. So when I talk about culture, it's more to do with many founders see it as something that you can fix later. You cannot. <laughs> you cannot fix it later. The sooner you fix it, the better. Right. Uh, but do you think culture, culture must stem from the founder by yeah, definition? Yeah, right? yeah it, it does. It, it actually... Your, your company team. manifests who you are at scale, right? Yes, not just you, mm. even like the first set of people that you're working with. And the dysfunctions there. Yeah, that, and then the interesting thing is uh, people tend to copy your bad behaviors, not, not your good ones. Yes. <laughs> so if you're doing something really, really well, they'll never do that. But think of a child, <laughs> one cuss word. <laughs> and they're they'll all too never forget that thing. They'll pattern it. <laughs> yeah, and then they'll forget. So even when you're know, starting now, Tanasuk Africa, uh, Tanasuk, the word means uh, it's an Arabic word meaning we thrive in balance. Mm. We were really like thinking through like what's the culture that we need to create, mm. and then how do we leave that culture, not just having it on a board and then it's, that's yeah. it. How it's actually a real thing. Yeah, how do we recruit for our culture? How do we protect our culture? And how do we even make sure that as we grow, mm. we don't lose it? So you can then imagine a big corporate like Safaricom or any of these other corporates who, who are trying to change the culture. It takes... It's probably impossible, to be honest, in one yes. lifetime, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes <laughs> and, you know, talking about culture, I mean, as, as an organization ourselves, Impact Africa Network, you know, we have a set of values that we, that, that basically we're, we're building around, which is performance, integrity, and collaboration. Those are the values that we, we look to live by. And for me, performance just means, you know, under-promising and over-delivering in every aspect of, of your life. And it, it's to me, I know that a lot of times people separate their private life from their professional life. Mm. And I, I just don't think you can do that. You are, you live out who you are in a lot of ways, right? Um, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so it's, it's an interesting thing. So one, we never say as a company that we are a family. We are not a family. Mm. We are a tribe of mm -hmm. like-minded individuals. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we entirely absorb your life into the company. Mm -hmm. In a way, there's still that separation and we need to be cognizant of the fact that in as much as we're trying to have the two integrated, there are elements of... No, I, to I completely yeah. agree. I'm not, okay. I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that people... Mm -hmm. I'm saying as an individual, mm -hmm. as a person, not mm -hmm. in the context of a company. Mm -hmm. As an individual, my personal belief mm -hmm. is what, I, what I've learned is that I, I just need to level up my performance as a human being. Oh, yes, yes. That's you see what I'm totally saying? And, and, I, and I can say, in, in, in a sense, I, I guess the question I have for you is just, do we have a culture of performance in our society? Not generally. It's, it's, the, it's the oddity, like the culture of performance is an oddity as compared to the norm. The norm is to do the bare minimum, bare minimum. in most situations. Why do you think that is if there's scarcity? What, what's the reason for this? I try to wrap my head around this. It might also be a factor of what, uh, what's, what, what's rewarded. Interesting. Like how do you set up your reward structures? So think of a traditional corporate whereby the bonuses and that type of thing is a very hierarchical processes and then people are always afraid that their juniors are going to subvert them. Ah. So in, you end up 
people do what you reward, yes. not what you say they should do, yes. or no, what they aspire to do. Right. It's what they, you punish or what you reward. It's a yeah, current mistake. Yeah, even the same thing with, like, look at many organizations trying to improve customer experience. Let me give, give you a very simple like, example, banks. Mm. They've been really, really trying to get people to use their apps, banks in Kenya and mm. Africa mm. across, mm. but they're allowing the short-term gains to override the longer term oh. gains. And a very practical example is mm. most banks charge you to check your balance. Can you imagine? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, so you have an app and then every time you want to check your balance, you're charged. It costs me money. Yeah. Do you know what users do when they find out they, they are charged to check their balance? They stopped using the app. So of course, that's from, using from a banking perspective, that line manager mm. has a revenue target. He needs to get and that. And that check balance feature is a big contributor to oh that revenue. Yeah. So it, it, it goes back to what rewarded. So exactly. if, if I'm a cleaner at a restaurant or something, mm. what's rewarded, if they don't care about the output of my work and move like seeing me there mm. i'm going to I'm just gonna show up and <laughs> yeah it's, it's the same thing like and these are interesting discussions that we have uh so we have an interesting thing we do in the company mm. we go for lunch every other week mm -hmm. as a team mm -hmm. just to get out of the office and hang out and just catch up and these discussions usually come up a lot and one of them that we are talking about is the perception of work mm -hmm. for many organizations work is something you go to. You go to, not what you do. Okay, there are situations where you work is something you actually go to. I mean, if you're the network manager for this building and you're doing support and that type of thing, I don't think you can do it remotely. Awesome. People need to see you in person. Sure. But for my design and engineering team, I really don't need to see you at the office every day. But you know, it's even, even it, okay, so I think you're talking about a very important thing. It's not even a question of the, 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 the difference between a job where you have to show up and one which you don't. Mm. It is also in your mind mm. what that actually means, right? Because mm. you could be, this is something that I've, I, have, I have thought about a lot, is people, where, where I became a professional, people take uh, personal responsibility for creating great outcomes. They become craftsmen and women, right? Okay. Like this is, this is I, I do, they separate, they almost, the fact that they're doing a job is almost like subordinate to the fact that yeah. they're doing the identities behind creating great things in the world, great outcomes. Mm -hmm. It's not everybody, but yeah. that's kind of the ethos that makes, that makes Silicon Valley special. And I think maybe a lot of other productive places in the world. I don't know. Like, yeah, and that, a big part of that is, apart from the personal drive to achieve great things, you also need an environment and a culture that supports, supports that. that. So if yes. you look at the example that you gave Silicon Valley, it's the, the, the culture of taking risks and making mistakes is well entrenched. But I think for a lot of uh, now upcoming companies and startups in our space, back to the idea of having one shot, we still don't have that culture. So you might have the personal drive, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, if you want to do great things, you have to take risks. But let me ask so, you this. Um, let's, let's even take this back to the corporate. Mm. I'm working in a corporate. I'm not taking risks, mm. right, per se, mm. as, as compared to a founder. You're actually taking a risk. Okay, explain that. Let me point. explain. Mm. So let's say we are supposed to do X this year. Maybe you are supposed to hit this revenue this year. Mm. You have an idea and that's quite good, but it's risky. Right. You might hit the Makes target sense. or right. not hit that. That's right. the risk that right, I'm right, talking right, about. Right, right, right. So such a culture in general and such perceptions and ways of working mm kind of force you to take the safer option right. because you lower your risk Risk exposure. Threshold, yeah. But if we have a culture of, yeah, we are allowed to make a mistake, mm. then, and then it's not, it has to be a cross board. Mm. It's not that certain people are allowed to make a mistake mm. and other people are allowed to make a mistake. And it goes back to the idea of, when you talk about culture, it's something that we need to enforce on a day-to-day -day basis and people need to feel that they are part of it, not that they're just following. So as an example, my, my colleagues kick me out of the office periodically. I keep telling people, don't overwork yourself, take breaks. But mm -hmm. guess who never takes breaks? <laughs> <laughs> the preacher. The yeah. preacher ain't taking his own medicine. Yeah, so then one of my colleagues was explaining to me that by not taking breaks, I'm communicating without saying that it's not okay to take breaks. Right. So people might feel 
I'm always taking a break. It never takes a break. Am I not like doing my best? But but let me ask you this. I mean, shouldn't your people feel mm. at some point? Shouldn't people feel that uh, that uh, they can just be themselves within an environment? Isn't yeah. that the best culture to create? No, of you, course, yeah. of course, of course. The, the the leader of the organization has a, a big shadow. Mm. But I think the best organizations that I have mm. read about, mm. heard about, and maybe been part of mm. are the ones where. I don't always have to mirror you because I'm an autonomous individual by myself. I have confidence in my work and in my ability to actually produce. I, I'm not trying to be like you, but at the same time, it's a chicken and egg, right? I mean, it's not always... Yeah, so the, that's the idea behind corporate governance when you actually define it. As an organization, you need a set, a set of things, a, a certain way you do things in general, mm -hmm. but you still need the flexibility to allow people to do things their way, mm -hmm. so that they are clear no -nos as a company, mm -hmm. like we don't do this as a company, mm -hmm. and then other things it's up to people to define and really figure it out on their way by, their, by themselves, and then also cultures evolve but you still need to watch yeah, out for yeah, yeah. like these are the things that we stand by mm. so just make sure you're within this you have that so an example is when you talk about trust as being one of your core values and then you're asking your employees that they have to come in by this time you don't trust them <laughs> it's just something so, your right, right. yeah so you you need that like overarching or like your key principles or your core principles but you still need flexibility within the organization such that so people trust, can... trust means you do not have too many rules in a sense because if yes. I trust you by definition you have a general guideline you know I don't have to write a rule book for you right? yeah because... then it has to go two ways right so the, the reason I'm saying that is uh you have to exhibit it in this way, in the sense that, as an example, for our organization, we run not open accounting per se, but we are very, very transparent about our books, the money we make, the proposals we send, and we share all that with our employees, mm -hmm. so that they also uh, we also earn their trust. Right. Because it's usually the other way around. Right, right. Yeah, so it has to be a two-way thing, and it, it cuts across all your other values. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think defining it clearly and sticking to it is really important mm. because it also allows you to recruit the right people to your organization. That won't like an open and it won't always work for everyone. Right. There are people who have a different culture. Right. And but if you them. define it and live by it and practice it, then and everybody recruit for your people. Right. Then you have a good thing going on. Culture is such a big deal because you know there's the there's the meta culture in which we exist in, right? The and maybe I'll I'll, I'll ask you to kind of define some of the things, some of the words that in your in your view define the broader culture in which we exist in. We've been touching on some of these ideas, mm. and then then let's take it from there and say, okay, how does it affect how people build internal cultures in the organization, right? So okay. talk a little bit about the broader culture in which we live in. How would you define it? Just some words to talk about our it's, culture in Kenya. For that, you have to actually go back to when you, how you grew up, right. how your parents treated you, how your teachers treated you. When you tried to do something different, what were you told? Like, that's where it starts. I don't think it's later in life course, when yeah. you start working in a company. So we have this culture of obeying authorities, mm -hmm. which automatically now... Enforce. Hierarchical. Yeah, it's very hierarchical, but now in a startup, having a hierarchical approach on work, good ideas don't always come but from I'll, the I'll top. Even, I'll even push on this. Is mm. it just a startup or is it in the modern world? Where in, yeah, actually in the modern world. Okay, it's, it's in the context of we are talking about startups, right. but generally in the modern world that doesn't work. So I think that's where we kind of get it wrong, uh, how we are nurtured. It's mm. not nature. It's how we are brought up. Mm. We, are, we are told to defer to authorities, mm. to listen without questioning, mm. Mm. and to wait for our turn and just be there. Mm. So it doesn't really allow a lot of people to self-express. Mm. It takes a bit of work for you to break out of that mold. But then you break out of that mold and everyone else is like that. It becomes a big challenge in the longer term. So when you say everyone else is like that, what do you mean? I, I mean maybe I've gotten around to like breaking those like thoughts of I need to behave this way. But yeah. now everyone I work with is doing that. 
is so behaving how? Is behaving he's now how? Sub, like subordinate the, to you, yeah. you deferring mm. to you, yes. not expressing themselves as exactly. you would like them to be. Yeah. So you, 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 you find that even though you want to be in an organization like that, the yeah. people... <laughs> the people you like... So, and then training people to change their minds around that is something that takes quite a bit of effort and seeing that if you look at most businesses it's we have to focus a lot on short-term goals mm. they don't really over well for the short-term goals so you just end up let it work the way it is mm. that's Interesting. how we work do you think that has some problems that that is a problem that local founders a blind spot for local founders yeah it is it is it's, it's a big blind spot in the sense that a lot of the founders we still have that mentality of not be, not wanting to be questioned in the sense that you you say that anyone can give an idea anyone can like direct how we go as an organization but in reality you never support people to do that because you started a thing you have the context you really struggle to get it where it is so you kind of quickly get to a point where you think you know everything mm. and then you end up surrounding yourself with yes men or yes women mm. who never really question like what you're trying to achieve and okay. why we are going in that direction versus this direction yet it's clear mm. that yeah so it's a big issue interesting i mean we've covered a lot of ground here and there's so much more we can cover i mean <clears throat> So the other thing too, because for me, culture, I believe mm. culture is, it's everything else for lunch. I mean, you can have the most, the best technology yeah. or whatever idea, but it will rise to the level of the culture will allow it to rise, right? And so, I mean, maybe just a few parting shots for, for, for the audience here and, and starting from the importance of, you know, design thinking, because obviously there are all these scarcity issues that force people to kind of be very... I don't know, um, short term in terms of what they're doing, to organizational development, right? To even being expressive and managing the PR game so you can actually start to, you know, attract the type of attention and funding. Maybe just give some parting shots to the audience, right? In terms of, because culture cuts across all this stuff, yeah. right? And yeah. culture defines all this stuff. And your culture evolves over time. Right. Yeah. But a culture as a, as a society, Right. Oh, as a society, that's a harder one. I don't even think I can address the societal one. Because it's, it, the societal one mm. is the one that now feeds all these pieces, right? Because people come with certain mindsets mm. into the game, right? Mm. I'm coming in with a mindset. Uh, scarcity leads to this situation where I need to kind of like, as quickly as possible, just, you know, get to sell my product or raise money. So it's a very, it's not a very, uh, the design element of thinking about how do I, how the customer's problems, how do I work back from that? Maybe it's short changed, you know? Yeah, but to be honest, if you use the design thinking approach, you, if you do it right. But the question is, why don't people, do people use it? One, it's an, it's an, it's a, it's a capacity issue. Mm. Like many people don't know of it. Like a lot of the conversations that we've had and the pictures that we've made to, Corporates and startups, they're like, oh my God, this exists. Like, it's, it's, it's surprisingly a new concept. I'm like, we've been doing this for like the last seven years. Maybe you Why just named it, like it but, but to me, I always think like, if you think about this, I mean, to me, it seems obvious, right? Yeah, it does seem obvious, but it's not obvious. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because the interesting thing, and it's even something that I've been speaking up about it more, it's more to do with design thinking as a way to innovate as a company. And that's very applicable now to the corporates, the older companies, the larger companies, because they're so entrenched in the hierarchical structure. The idea behind design thinking in general is good ideas come from anywhere. anywhere right. And in as much as we're collaborating and testing and trying out different things, we also need to factor in who's, who has the highest exposure. So we also need to think of Think of the CEO. The CEO is more knowledgeable around strategy and longer term play mm -hmm. compared to someone who's a bit more tactical on a day to day right. basis. So right. we still need to marry those two, but we need to create an environment that allows people to pitch in and, and like share their thoughts and mm -hmm. think through different things without the hierarchy necessarily. You know, this is so. I was listening to this other podcast and you kind of summarized this very, very well. And I think we'll end with this. At the end of the day, you hire people for their brain power. Yep. and for their for their creativity mm -hmm. right you don't hire them to show up yeah right but we tend to have this thing 
of showing up and then putting your brain on pause because you've got your side hustle. <laughs> not, even, not even side hustle. Like you've tried to get, you have some good ideas. You've tried to push for them to be implemented, not but happened. they always return. So after a while, you kind of like, give up. Yeah, let me just use these ideas Tell myself. The right. And then also there's the risk factor to you that you may get fired. Right. By always opposing and saying we can do it differently. And then you might look like the troublesome person. But the thing is, you are actually trying to do the job you are hired yes. to do. Yes, yes. But if the culture and the environment doesn't allow you to do it, you, got problems. you either throw the line or leave. Man, this is, we could cover so much ground on this. And Kiri, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come through. Anytime. I mean, Impact Africa Network, we are bullish about the, the, what I call the new economy, right? Because, you know, like you've mentioned, some people who were with you back in the day at IAB and now they've they built companies. Final question for you here is, what is your um, projection of where we, where we are going in the next 10 years? Do you see... Uh, are you bullish about it or are you kind of mm, or are you kind of like, yeah, we're going backwards in terms of the ecosystem, no. building new companies? We, we're actually doing well and it's an interesting reason. More of the non-traditional types of founders are getting into our market. Mm -hmm. Like people who are in, traditionally in business mm -hmm. are now seeing the power of technology. Interesting. And they are trying to figure out how they can start companies mm -hmm. that rely on technology to deliver the service mm -hmm. and I think that's actually going to be a game changer for mm -hmm. our space mm -hmm. and then also there's the compounding factor of we're seeing more and more startups growing mm -hmm. and having a bigger impact and going mainstream right. it's just going to snowball into something bigger so what's your vision 2030? Um, I think we'll have a more mature tech or startup ecosystem in the sense that not from an exit perspective, mm, but more sure just company. like pure company size yes. and just the number of players who got into the product market fit and are gaining traction and actually making a difference in that's the market. Awesome. That's, yeah. that's very much aligned with us because <clears throat> what I say is uh, my vision 2030 is to be able to stand back mm. and gaze at the Silicon Savannah skyline mm. and pick out great African companies that Impact African Network was part of building or supporting in the early days. And that is kind of what defines everything we do. So we are, uh, you know, we, we've piv since I came into the market, we've pivoted, I've pivoted a couple of times. At first, I thought it was about funding. Yeah, that's always expected, yes. pivoting. And that actually shows that you're learning. Mm. Uh, it, I thought it was about funding problem. It is funding, but it's not the entire story. Mm. Um, and I don't think, ex you know, you, you need to be able to bring, like you said, some of the folks who are coming from traditional business to learn about the tech business. Mm. So you need seasoned people yeah. to build companies, right? Yeah, domain experts. Basically. Domain experts and partnering with technologists. Yep. I think that's where the magic is. Yeah, and that's actually the part that we are now starting to play a bigger role in as Tanasuka Africa. One of the issues that we've identified is around the uh, design and engineering talent, especially for non-technical founders. Mm, so you have a really, really solid idea, but you don't have but you've idea. never built a product. So it's it's just a nightmare. Most of them work with a freelancer, they get banned and then they think the entire ecosystem is rotten in that sense. <laughs> so we also hoping to play a bigger role yeah. in being what you'd call technical co founders uh, there you for, go. for non technical yeah. entities and right. you've already signed up a partner already. Yeah. It's still in the works, so I can't talk about which one. But the idea is, yeah, let's figure out how we can create mutually beneficial relationships. Because in for us, there's a, it's not just pure consultancy. Right. If the company grows, we grow with them. That's that's true. And we kind of help each other out. They are domain experts. They know how the industry works. works. We'll help you with the design process, the engineering, and the growth of the platform. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar to what we do as a startup studio. Of course, for us, we focus also on just internal projects. We're working with interns. Uh, we're bringing on interns to work in terms of our, of our capacity building, professional services team, and also... Uh, technical uh, technical interns who can become entrepreneurs in residence, and we put them in this environment mm -hmm. where we can work with them. And at the same time, you know, I've also I've come across people who've reached out to me and said, "Hey, I'm stuck. I've got this idea." And again, domain experts in mm -hmm. traditional in, yeah, industry, industries, and they've reached out. Yeah, I've seen opportunities, yeah. but they just don't know how to, to progress move it from an idea to. Right. Something. And I think there'll be opportunities for you and I to collaborate on this. We yeah. just need to keep talking and find a, a way to work together. To, you know, look, I mean, the, the future looks bright. If we can stay out of our own way, yeah. <laughs> I think Nairobi has a chance to. It does.
to and if we can talk a bit more about the challenges that startups face uh, the reasons founders exit we can't always be having like the good news only we also it doesn't need to be in like the total public sphere but we need to have more Less real conversations the... around Mistakes. so this is what happened this is maybe they had an issue with corporate governance and that's a lesson as a startup founder you can take you really need to think about your corporate governance you need to think about how you do your financials you need to really know is it a good time for you to take a plunge so one thing i tell Almost everyone who's fresh out of school don't start a company. Interesting. I tell them the opposite. Not, <laughs> I tell you them know. the opposite because, mm. um, well, don't start. You're right. Don't start a company because you don't have the expertise. But if you can mm. find, you don't even know how to do the finances. But, if but, you can do that part, then what business are you? But but here's the thing. If you look at mm. Silicon Valley, for example, YC, right? Mm. They take all these young people from uh, Stanford. Mm. they they've and then they go and start companies, but they have the, they have the capacity, the support. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They can bring all these domain experts to support those founders to move forward. Mm-hmm. That is, because if you think about it also, Kirui, mm-hmm. who is most in a position to take that risk? Is it somebody who's five years into their career or somebody who's just starting out? You see that we've got this chicken Yeah, and yeah I totally understand what you're talking about. Yeah, but then in that case, you need to use the two approaches. Because the idea is for someone who's fresh out of university, mm. they are not, unless we now start doing that exposure a bit earlier, such that people are experimenting and playing around in university itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are things that they should not be learning while they have employees, mm-hmm. things around HR and... Let me tell you, like, this is not, let me be honest with you, this is not unique to us. There's a lot of the same problems exist in the Bay Area, in the mature ecosystem, because they're technical founders and they've not been exposed to HR. Who, who, I mean, where are you going to learn that? And so, for example, one of my favorite um, uh, venture firms that I follow religiously is called Andreessen Horowitz. You know, is yeah, I, yeah. they have a deep bench of domain experts. Oh, that can work with to help yeah. their technical founders not make these HR mistakes yeah. and the sales mistakes and all these mistakes. Yeah. So, you know, in, in, a, in a way, I firmly believe we need to be able to support entrepreneurs much better because, look, yeah. they are good in one area. Mm-hmm. They're not going to be good. Yeah, true. That, that's very true. If for mm, the, the, the statistics around the more successful founders, yeah, they tend to shift towards people of towards the order, yeah. And, yeah. and there's a reason for it. Right. Like even if you look at our ecosystem, most of these guys that you're talking about at this point in time, they probably started out a traditional engineering career, kinda of learned a bit more in that space. And it wasn't a team more to do with HR and the other things. Mm-hmm. It's just being a good being a good yeah. A good engineer, a good designer and that type of a thing. Mm-hmm. A good number of the Kenyan ones first started out with running software consulting companies mm-hmm. I've seen that, and yeah. then they were able to balance the software consulting revenue with now a building product. a product slowly yes. and yes. then at some point they jumped over right. it's a longer term play but it's a more practical one for even our market yeah so the question to you would probably be how do you go about supporting experienced people and getting them to take the leap and start companies so someone who works in a bank you know, to be honest with you, that's not my audience. Oh, that's not your that's audience. That's not my audience. Yeah. My audience, my, the people I'm focused on, is mm. the people who are coming out of college right now. That's why we have a startup studio, because we bring everything together, mm. right? These are people who are ready to take risks. We bring them on as interns. Mm. We can actually, and when we start pursuing ideas with the design thinking and working from the customer backwards, market research, and put them in an environment where they can actually uh, learn and test. And so you have to provide a safe space, to yeah. be honest with you. Because on their own, what are too many mistakes, as you yeah. know, right? Yes, right. yeah. Then it's still, it's, it's still a spray and pray. <laughs> Hopefully, a couple of them. No, but to see, the but it's not it's not valueless in the sense that at the end of the day, you're still doing capacity building. You, but here, for us, it's mm-hmm. it's very well picked ideas. Mm-hmm. It's not fifty thousand of them. It's this market is underserved. Because I've actually done the research to identify that. Mm. Some people come with their own ideas. Hey, I'm building this cool thing. Oh, okay, let's do some let's let's do the design thinking thought process as opposed to just you having your great idea. And then kind of not knowing how to sequence it. Yeah. Anyway, listen, 
<laughs> you need to come for part two. We're just, <laughs> we're just getting started on this. I want to thank you again for coming through. And um, Kirui, any parting shots for the, for the audience? Final advice? Fall in love with the process, not the publicity and everything else. The day-to-day -day boring. It looks boring, but that's actually where you, you move forward. The day-to-day -day, like processes or things that you need to do to get your company going. Fall in love with that, not the speaking opportunities, not the public recognition. It, that will come later, but what will actually get you to the level that you want is the boring day-to-day -day processes. Awesome. With that, thank you so much. Anytime. Yeah.